The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. My husband, Steve Siegel, is the producer of the podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share, please reach out to us, theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com. Please also remember to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you give us a five-star rating, then Google helps people find us. And we are always trying to give messages of hope and to let people know that help is available for this horrible thing called addiction. Today's episode is episode number 310, and today's episode is an interview with a gentleman named Joseph Cagey. Joseph has overcome his struggle with drug addiction after being a slave to it for 11 years. His addiction led him to serve two separate prison sentences and being at a place where suicide seemed like the only option. Finally, he realized his only way of living a life worth living was to face his addiction head on and work towards living a sober life. Today, he has five plus years of sobriety. He's a husband, a father, and a business owner. His life mission now is to share his story and give hope and inspiration to anyone who feels like they are fighting their own demons and can't find hope in their life. Without further ado, let's talk to Joseph KG. Joseph KG, thank you so much for being willing to be on the podcast today and sharing your story. We have told quite a few stories um, from people who were formerly addicted and who are in recovery. And I know it's not necessarily the most fun time of your life. So I appreciate you being willing to talk about it. Of course, absolutely. You know, even though you say that, when you say not the most fun, I just think about it's, it was the most essential. You know, it was because of that that I'm where I am today. And that's, that's the purpose of talking about it. So thanks for having me and giving me this platform to hopefully bring some value to you and your listeners. Absolutely. And that's an interesting perspective. I like that perspective that it's essential to where you are today, basically. Absolutely. So how did, where did you grow up? What was, you know, just briefly, what was your childhood like? And how did you get started in drugs? And what drugs were those? Yeah, of course. So I grew up, my family's, I'm second generation from the Middle East. So my family was born and raised in Iraq. Uh, They're Catholic Christians, you know, Iraqis. And I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. So currently right now I'm living in uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Um, And I grew up around really a close knit family. You know, it was all about family. And, you know, know, my dad owned a convenience store. So my dad was working, you know, 18 hour days. And my mom was at the house raising us either at the house or in the store. So we grew up, I have have a brother, sister, and, and you would almost say that, you know, when you I think a lot of people think of addiction, you look at my family, and, and I think that was the toughest thing was, it doesn't seem like, like a family that you would think addiction would, you know, enter into the family. But I always say addiction does not discriminate, it does not have racial, it affects anybody. That's right. Um, and so for me, I, you know, growing up, honestly, it was, I would call it a normal childhood, going to school, doing, you know, play, I was an athlete, I played sports, so I had a lot of friends. Um, you know, I did I did start drinking like at a young age, not realizing it was a problem. It was just kind of with my cousins thinking this is normal. Um, and, and one of the things that happened that was a dramatic thing in my life was when I was 14 years old, my dad moved us from Detroit, Michigan to Jacksonville, Florida, where I didn't really know anybody. Um, a lot of it was because my dad just wanted to start a new life for his family. He grew up working you know, all the time. The business brought a little bit of issues with with family because he wanted to work all day. And my mom wanted to play a little bit. And that was tough. Yeah. So and that tough was one of one of the I would say the, the moments in my life where I started to try to find out who I was now because I felt like I couldn't be me in in the culture that I was in Florida, you know, because I was trying to make new friends and I didn't know who to be. It's a tough age to move like that, yeah. that dra- drastically, especially if you don't have total certainty on who you are and your own identity. Because now, yeah. not only do you have to find that, but you're in a completely new environment and you don't know anybody. Exactly. Exactly. And and I also had a very, I had a hatred, like even the word resentment people use, mine was worse than resentment. Like I absolutely hated my father for moving us here. Uh. Uh, and And that anger led to me deciding in my own mind at the age of 13, 14 years old 
that I'm going to make sure that this move was not going to be a good one. Like I remember trying out for the basketball team and my dad getting a little bit excited that, oh, that's so great. And I remember thinking, no, I don't want him to be. You know, at that young age, I just I just wanted to prove to him that this was bad. Yep. So I ended up, you know, kind of just trying to fit in wherever I could. Uh, if the guys who smoked weed on the weekends wanted me to do that with them, I did that. And in this journey of I would I don't know how long it, it, it was the process of me trying to know who am I, I became very depressed because at the end of the day, I didn't know who I was because the guys who skipped school, I'd be like them. But then the kids who were good in school and I hung out with them, I'd be like them. And so I became these so many different versions of Joseph that at the end of the day, I didn't know who I was. And then I was introduced to opiates at the age, almost 15 years old. Hmm. And when I took opiates for the first time, I remember saying, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Because what the drug did for me was it removed me from me. I liked the effects, as they say, produced by the drug. I didn't feel. If I was sad, I took it. If I was happy, I took it. So any emotion that I had, you know, and I always say this, at the age of 14, I didn't know how to deal with my emotions. Right. You know, I didn't know what to do when I was sad. I didn't, my, me and my dad didn't really talk, so I didn't have people to talk to. And that's what I found my solution. And so I, when I took opiates for the first time, I said it, that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And from the age of 14 to the age of 26, if you want to find somebody who tried every way to make that possible, I did. What um, were you taking, Joseph? I was taking opiates. So it was Oxycontin. Okay. Um, and here in Florida during that time, which this was about 15, 16 years ago, there was Pill a big- mills. Pill mills. Exactly. Yeah. And you're familiar with it because of Clearwater, the same thing happened there. So yep. it was so easy to obtain yep. that it, it wasn't a problem. My issue was keeping up with the financial part of the addiction, um, which, you know, it led me to the place for the first time in my life when I didn't have money and I woke up without the drug and I never felt this feeling before of I don't have the drug in my life that's helped me cope with life. And also I have the sickness that's coming upon me that I've never felt in my life before. And in my own mind, I didn't know what to do. The only thing I knew to do was go to the thing that would remove this. But I didn't have the money for it. So how do I get the money now? And at that point, uh, that's that's when I started on my journey of, as you say, the point in turn. I was willing to do whatever it took. Taking right. from the restaurant that, you know, stealing from them, stealing from family, stealing from friends. Um, not well, even worried about consequences. I'm sorry, what restaurant? What do you mean, Joseph? I was working at a, um, oh, yeah, okay. I, I put, should have put some context. So I was working at a restaurant at the time. Okay. Um, and, and that's where I first started. You know, it was a guy that worked at the restaurant that introduced me to it. So uh, at the age of 15, I was working at this restaurant. I'd start stealing from out of the register, blaming other people. You know, it, it came to a point that I didn't care who I hurt or what happened. All I cared about was one thing, getting the money for my drugs. Right. Um, and that led me to the first time at, at the age of 18, actually facing real consequences um, of I was facing. I ended up doing two years in a Florida state prison at the age of 18. Wow. For for it was robberies. Um, mm. I would I would rob people. I would steal from them. You know, at first it would start stealing from friends and family because I would think, well, they're not going to call the police. Worst case scenario, they just don't like me, kick me out. And who cares? You know, I, at that point, I'll figure it out. Right. Um, yeah. So at, at that point, my mindset was there was nobody in my life that I met that was actually grateful that they met me. I was creating damage in every area that I that if you were in my life, it was unfortunately my chaos became yours. And, and that became Obviously, when when I couldn't steal from anybody else because nobody would keep me around them, uh, I would I would obviously commit crimes to people that didn't know me, and at that that's what led me to my first time going to prison at the age of eighteen. Wow! And you did two years, you said, right? I did two years. Okay, yep, and then did. did did that cause you to get clean and sober, or did you continue after that? You know, I always struggled with the word addict. Um, I have pride and ego that I still fight today. <laughs> when I heard the word addict, I thought about people who couldn't figure it out, right? I thought about people who just said, I got a problem and I don't know. And I did not want to accept that issue. I wanted to figure it out. You know, I, I was like, I'm not like those addicts. When I thought of an addict, I thought about the guy who was shooting up on the corner 
sleeping in trash cans, eating out of trash cans. And that wasn't me. You know, I was just the guy who stole and robbed people. You know, right. I created the narrative that that made me feel better about myself. Right. So when I came home, I just thought if I just change the people I hang out with and if I just maybe go into college, you know, maybe I can start new things. I thought if, if if I could go to college, I'd be fine. If I could change the circle I'd hang out with, I'd be okay. The problem was no matter where I went, I was still left with me. Uh, that was the biggest problem, you know, and you got to remember now I'm, I get out of prison at 20 years old. The problem with Joseph now is I still don't know how to deal with my emotions because the only way I've dealt with them is taking drugs. So now when I get into college and I have fears and I, ha I have the same doubts that I had of fitting in, Am I good enough? I didn't know how to deal with those. And and I don't know how long it took. As wild as it sounds, I don't even remember how I went back that fast. But eventually, I was using opiates again. And I remember driving to a drug dealer's house. And when I left one time, I thought about this for the first time. I can't believe I'm doing this again. Mm. You know, how did I even get here? You know, almost feeling robotic, like not even understanding how I got to this point. But at that point... Again, I would have had to admit that I have an issue. I have a problem. And I wasn't willing to admit that to another human being. Right. You know, especially the culture I grew up in. Men, we don't talk about the problems that we have. We face them head on and we deal with them. Don't tell anybody about your problems. Figure it out. Well, this was an area I couldn't figure out. You know, I couldn't at all. Yeah. And eventually, again, I end up in prison again, uh, uh, committing similar crimes. And this time I, I was 20 almost 23 years old and I got a three-year sentence. Wow. And again, you would think, Joseph, you, you got to figure it out now. <laughs> and again, Joseph tried to figure it out. And in prison, I'll say this, there's more drugs in prison than there is on the street. I've heard that. Yeah. So I didn't stay sober. Right. What happened for me was, you know, I, I, I call him God and this is my higher power. He brought me to a place that said, try everything you can, but I'm going to take you to a place that you know that if I do this again, I have no other option. My back was against the wall. And, and the day my back was against the wall was January 24th, 2019, which is my sobriety date. I'm sitting in a 10 by 10 cell with four months left of my prison sentence. And there's a guy in front of me who's almost maybe 60, 70 years old, who spent his career and his life inside of prison. And he looks at me and he says, you're going to be just like me. Ah. For the first time in my life, I believed him. I believed him. I, I, everybody said, if you don't change, Joseph, you're going to come back. And I said, you can haters and you're just, you, you know, I didn't believe them. But for the first time in my life, I believe this guy. The second part that happened there for me was I was scared because the truth was if that guy would have had drugs on him and offered to me, I would have taken it. Mm. Knowing that if I continue on this path, I'm going to be like this guy. Right. So facing my fear head on, but not willing to be able to know if I could say no to a drug that day was the absolute most fear I've ever had in my entire life. Wow. So that was it. That was kind of where you decided you needed to get clean and sober. That's when I decided that I need to figure out how to do this, but I don't know how. Right. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727-314-314. 7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five star review. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years' experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 866-989-4499 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. That I would say was your point of no return.
That was. That was my point of no return. Sitting there facing, um, you know, understanding that if I use drugs and alcohol again, I'm going to end up dead or in prison. And with absolute fear, I think that the fear allowed me to humble myself to say, I need to find help. You know, and, and with four months left of my sentence, I did find an Alcoholic Anonymous a book that I've never read before. I've been given too many times, but I, I never wanted to open it. And all of a sudden, I think this person's writing this book about me. It was amazing. I was, mm-hmm. I was in utter shock. And this is not to promote the program, obviously, of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it was the book that I read that I was like, this is unreal. Yep. And, well, you know, and people I- get sober different ways, whatever it takes. You know, if that helped you. Of course. And that's what I always say. It, it worked for me. It does, you know, I, I can't tell you what would work for you. I can just share with you what worked for me. Right. Right. Yeah. So as soon as I came home, I stepped into um, reaching out to people that I knew that were in recovery. And I, I honestly started my journey of, of honest openness and willingness for the first time in my life, not only with myself, but with other human beings, which is something that was not normal for me at all. Wow. So you said January 24, 2019. So you were just about up on four years clean and sober, correct? That's right. Awesome. Very well done. Very well done. I know it's not easy, but very well done. Yeah. And so you then have taken your sobriety and turned it around to help others, right? And that's the journey. It was giving to other people. It was freely given to me. Um, and, and you know, what's amazing about it is when you, when I look back at how scared I was thinking that I don't know what this is and I was so afraid when I look back at it to, it was not hard. Like it, it's, it, yes, it was tough because it was uncomfortable and I've never done these things before. Right. But it just taught me. Yeah. Um, I bring men on there, whether they're in recovery or not. And we talk about real life struggles. And I learned that through recovery of being honest, open, and willing to share with somebody else what I'm going through. Because I believe if I get vulnerable with you, I can actually help you and you can help me. Do you have a podcast? Is that what you said? And you bring people on there? Is that I, I'm where it started was you said, I bring men on here who've experienced the same thing. And I wasn't sure what you were talking about. Do you have a podcast? Is that what you do? Yep. So I have a podcast, okay. but I also have a community group called Let's Get Real. Okay. For men. Let's Get Real. I like that. <laughs> yep. And and really it's, it's, I bring a topic for 10 minutes. I get vulnerable with them and I allow them to unmute themselves and say, what is, what is some area in your life that you can relate to this? And they can open up and share something that they're going through that they've never shared before. So they don't have to carry that weight anymore. Right. You know, I, I feel like as humans, we are so used to carrying the weight. I, I say men and women probably struggle with this too, but I can relate to men more yep. Yep. Um, that we just want to carry it ourselves. Yep. You know, that I got this. I don't want to tell somebody else what I'm going through. And, and then what happens is we're carrying around a weight that was not meant for us to carry. Right. And it affects other areas of our life. Right. Yep. yep. A weight that, a weight that others can help with, you know? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And what's amazing is when you get that weight off yourself and you are vulnerable with somebody else, you give other people permission to be vulnerable too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's why we have people such as yourself on the podcast, because our hope is that someone listens and goes, wow, if Joseph can tell his story and he was able to reach for help, maybe I can reach for help, you know? That's right. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, I was always afraid to talk about my story um, because today I'm a business owner as well. So I was afraid that if I talk about being in recovery and going to prison as a business owner, will people not want to do business with me? Right. And, and some people would say, you're probably right. Right. And what's but your business? A big- it's a it's a fencing business, right? That's correct. Yeah, we do residential fencing in, in all the areas here in Florida, not just Jacksonville, any surrounding area where we're at. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And I can understand that fear that some people would go, oh, no, this guy's just a druggie and he was in prison and we don't want to hire him. But obviously you've overcome that. I have. And the main reason is it took me a little bit of while to understand what I really wanted out of my life. And my biggest mission was to share hope to people. It really was. And I remember thinking that if, you know, I, I 
did a conversation with that individual. Um, and I still talk to them today. Awesome. And because, and, and they tell me, man, when I saw that post, it changed my life. And it was just one post. And I thought about, you know what? I would lose 10 customers for this one guy. And when, I, when that happened, I remember thinking, you know what? I'm going to put out my stuff. I'm going to share my story. I'm going to talk to people about it. Because honestly, when I got sober, I, I loved hearing other people's stories. It gave me hope. Right. So I wanted to do the same thing for other people. And if, if it lost me a job or two because a customer don't want to do business with them, that's fine. And honestly, I, I haven't seen it. Um, our business is thriving. I've had customers tell me, hey, I heard your podcast. I never knew that. That's really awesome. You know, I think that's really cool. Um, you know, and maybe some people who heard it and decided not to do that. I'm not sure, but I know I'm on a doesn't mission. matter. It that's, doesn't matter. That's their loss. And the name of the podcast is Let's Get Real, right? That's correct. Yep. It's called Let's Get Real with Joseph KG. Awesome. And your community, is it a community on Facebook or just through your website? Yep. Or It's okay. a community group on Facebook. So if okay. you go to Facebook, um, and right now it's a men's community. Okay. Um, and, and it's because one of my missions right now that I'm, I'm seeing in a lot of men is they don't have a place to go, you know, to talk about the things that they're going through. Right. Um, you know, and, and sometimes they're afraid. Like I, I know some people hop on the call and they get a little bit afraid because they're like, what is this about? But it's great because I start the call with me being vulnerable um, and, and me talking about some stuff I'm going through and then I'm learning and wondering if anybody relates, you know, and and. One guy let some weight off his chest, you know, actually last night we do it every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Okay. And he said something that he's never said in a year, just talking about his wife who had a stroke and she's been in, you know, in and out of the hospital for a couple of years, but he's dealing with some emotions right now and he doesn't know how to cope with it. Right. Um, and he's never said that. And at the end of the call, he said, you know, what's crazy guys. I feel so much better right now and nothing's changed. And it's only because he had a place to talk about it. And that's the mission for the community. Yep. And that's a major change, though, when you can admit what's going on and just get other people to just listen and hear you. That's a big deal. Do you know? Yeah. yeah I think you offer a great service and a, and a great message of hope for the men who need it. You know? Of course. You know, we all want to be seen, heard, and understood. We all that's do. Right. That's right. The problem that I tell not just men, but women as well, anybody, if you want to be seen, heard and understood, how can anybody see you if you're not opening your eyes and allowing them to see you? And how could they understand you if you're not speaking? And nobody can understand you if you're not being authentic and being honest with what you're actually going through. That, that's, right. that's why you're not understood. Yep, that's right. Well, I think that's huge. So just to, once again, for the listeners, it's called Let's Get Real group on Facebook. Is it a private group? Like they have to ask to join, I'm assuming. They do, but I, I, any anybody can join. Like I said, it, it is a men's community group. Um, my wife has thought about possibly creating a women. She's already got, you know, this is the one thing that I, the reason that it motivated me. My wife is also in recovery and okay. I watch her and all these women get together and I watch her and all these women open up to each other. Yep. And I'm always looking around like, why don't men have this? Yep. And the more men I talk to like, yeah, that would be cool. And I'm always looking for it. And I'm like, where? And I understand in recovery, we have the meetings. But I'm just saying outside of just recovery, yep. you know, business owners, husbands, yep. fathers, these women get together. They share their experiences with each other. They carry each other's weight together. And they born, they, they form this bond and this friendship that is indescribable. Yep. And I always thought, where is this for men? Until <laughs> finally, my wife looked at me and she goes, babe, you're a business owner. You create, make something. Yep. And and the light turned off. And I said, yep. I'm going to create something. I'm going to create a place for men that they can do the same thing. I love that. I love that. And if your wife would like to be on the podcast, tell her, hook her up with us. Because we'd love to she tell would, her story as well if she wants. She would love to. I'm trying to get her on my podcast. Um, <laughs> my wife is the opposite of me when it comes to like speaking. And, and she's really good at it. You know, my wife is like, I even tell her, I said, you know, you, you are so, she's such an honest and open and She's who she is. I call her like my sweet little butterfly because <laughs> when you look at Heidi, you fall in love with her. Oh, you know? I love she, that. She's who she is and she loves herself and she's not trying to be anybody else. That's what makes her great. But she's a little camera shy. So if I can get her on yours, maybe that'll bring her on mine. I'll, I'll see. Ask her. Tell her I'm a woman and I don't ask hard questions. I just want to <laughs> hear her story. And, you know, and she obviously knows that by sharing you know, with others, it's, it's very valuable. 
It's very valuable to those, to anybody listening. And that's, that would be the whole purpose, but thank yeah. you for taking the bull by the horns and creating a group, you know, and a community and a podcast. And it's huge. I, I appreciate you for what you're doing very much. Of course. No, absolutely. And you know, one thing I'll say too is, is because I know when people are stuck in their addiction, you know, I, I always wondered you know, about my life because of all the damage I've created and the wreckage of my past. And I I never thought in my wildest dreams that I could give it a purpose. What purpose would it be to, you know, have a mother who's got to face her son in prison several times, stealing from people, people who tell me that I still can't sleep at night because when our house got broken into, we get bothered. How can any of this create a purpose? Until I realized that if I can get over my past and use it now, allow it to be the reason that I'm going to bring hope and bring value to people. Because there's many people that I talk to today that have broken into homes and feel not valuable because of the damage they did. And I can look at them and say, I know how you feel. You know, so I always tell people that there is a greater purpose. You know, my story didn't have to end. It was just a comma. It was a chapter in my book. Yep. And I decided that let me face the most uncomfortable thing that I felt was uncomfortable to to hopefully create, you know, people have been asked me, did you believe you were going to stay sober? Did you believe in everything they told you? And absolutely not. Right. I did it. I didn't believe it. But, you know, I didn't even know how it worked. I didn't understand how any of this works. But I tell people this all the time. I don't know how when I start my car, somehow I put that thing in R and it backs up. I have no idea how that works. <laughs> And I don't even know how when I turn my light on, it knows to turn it on. Like, I don't I don't understand those things. Yep. The difference is I don't try to understand them. I want them to work. So I just turn it on and I move. And yep. I would encourage anybody that's listening to this, whether you're in addiction or you have a loved one that's in addiction, which that's the hardest conversation to have is the people that have to deal with the addict because yep. that's hard. And I, I've been realizing a lot of parents have been reaching out to me more because they hear my stuff and they, they, they won't help. Yep. And yep. And I always tell people that you don't have to understand it. Just trust it, even if it's 1%. I I tried my own way and it didn't work. So it was time for me to say, maybe this will work. I don't even want you to say it will. Just maybe. Yep. You take that little step of faith. Yep. I like that. I think that's perfect. Joseph, thank you so much for talking to us today. I know that your story is going to help others, and that's huge. Of course. And and honestly, anybody that that I can help, you know, whenever I give my social media stuff out or I give, you know, anything where they connect with me, like I'm big on saying, send me a message. You know, I want to connect with you. That's my purpose now is to connect with people so we can do life together. Yep. I love it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Great story. He has a story that I think is probably similar to a lot of you listening or you know someone with a similar story. And he found his reason to get clean and sober and he got clean and sober and he's giving messages of hope. So that's the whole name of the game. Thank you for listening. We'll be back again next week with another interview, kind of a different subject, but one that we think will resonate with you. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.